I have a bit of a confession slash apology to make. I've said some pretty slanderous things regarding the new Super Mario series for a few years now. I've had many people ask me why I don't enjoy the series or what I thought of a particular entry. And it all started with this one thing I said in my Mario 3D World review. Let's take a look. The original on the DS was good, but it got just as bad as Call of Duty when they started throwing them out almost every year with next to no changes. Damn, that was over five years ago. I really don't think it was fair of me to lump together an entire series in such a negative connotation like that. I'd like to think I've matured a bit in these last five years, and I'm willing to hold my tongue and give each entry a fair shake before writing it off. So what do you say? I think it's time to take an extremely analytical approach and review all of these on their own merits. So, grab your popcorn, grab your soda, because this is going to be one hell of a giant comprehensive video. We're going game to game, ultimately answering the question, which new Super Mario is king? Well, except we won't look at Deluxe because it's like two games in one, so it's not really fair. I mean, if your favorite game was Dig Dug, you'd say Dig Dug. You wouldn't say Namco Museum 3 because Dig Dug is on it. Hey, I'm Salak Hawk. This is a video voted on in Patreon supported by people such as Rachel White, Ken Colton, King Cosmic, and Cashinator, and this is a retrospective on the entire new Super Mario Bros. series. Released back in 2006 for the original Nintendo DS, the first game in the series is generally the highest regarded, and subsequently, the entry critiqued the least. While I'm not here to argue whether or not that's fair to its successors, I do think it's important to acknowledge the context in which this game came out so we understand why this is. Before the release of New Super Mario Bros, excluding ports and remakes, we hadn't had a classic 2D Mario adventure since Super Mario Land 2 in 1992. So yeah, it had been nearly 14 years since we played a brand new 2D the adventure. The label of new, all these games in the series share, is little more than a joke by this point. But understand, at the time, the original new Super Mario Bros was well worthy of its title. It really did feel like a modern take on a classic formula. Your objective was to get to the end of each stage, much like the 2D Marios of old, but now with all the elements we've been seeing in the 3D Mario games. For the first time ever in a 2D Mario, we could double jump, triple jump, wall jump, and even ground pound. Other stuff we saw in 3D Marios, such as modern enemies and red coins, also make their first 2D appearance here. Beyond modernizing the formula, it seems like the goal of the original NSMB was to welcome old fans back into the series. Namely, this resulted in two things. The first is everything is incredibly streamlined here. Worlds are nicely, albeit perhaps lazily, laid out in a clear path from left to right. Controls have again been simplified to just run and jump. The bottom screen will tell you exactly how far you are in any given stage. All of the world themes, even the two themes new to the series, those of which being the cliffside theme and the poisonous jungle theme, play it relatively safe and will feel very nostalgic to veterans. You can select a world from the bottom screen and travel there anytime, and the story is more simplified than ever. The second thing that really separates this from the older games is the new Super Mario games are about as hard as a kindergarten's math quiz, and not just the DS1. All of these games, with maybe the exception of the last game we'll be looking at, are incredibly forgiving, which isn't inherently a bad thing. Speaking for myself here, I love a casual game time to time, although it is something that definitely separates the new from the old. I can make myself out to be some old, out-of-touch grandpa all I want, constantly going, eh, back in my day, but clearly Clearly, Nintendo knew what they were doing when it came to modernizing the formula. Not only was the original New Super Mario Bros. the best-selling game on the Nintendo DS, but it's still, to this day, the best-selling NSMB game in the entire series. The bottom line. If you're someone who prefers the later entries, and questions why it's the first installment that gets all the praise, it's because the original not only established an entire series, but it redefined what a 2D Mario was. Period. When you're comparing Mario Wii to its predecessor, you're comparing this to this. But when you're comparing Mario DS to its 2D predecessor, you're comparing this to that. Nuff said. But does that mean the game's good? Well, let's take a look. In the story, Mario and Peach are going for a nice stroll when Bowser hires the abilities of the Greek god Zeus to strike lightning down onto the castle. I don't know, do you got a better explanation? Mario goes to check on the castle, and by check on the castle, I mean just stare at it for a couple of seconds, when Bowser Jr. kidnaps Princess Peach amongst all the chaos. And uh, yeah, that's basically it. Again, super simple plot, even for Mario. It throws you right in, and I can respect that. Eight worlds to travel through, get to the end of each stage, sounds pretty familiar. So what's new? Well, Mario himself controls differently, even excluding his new moves. A lot of people like to use the word floaty to describe these games, and while naysayers will assert that doesn't mean anything, I decided to take a 
deeper look. I was shocked to find that from a standstill, Mario jumps about the same height as previous games. Four blocks. One thing to note, however, is the size of Mario himself. In all three of these clips, the question block is exactly four blocks off the ground. Despite this, the block on DS looks like it's the closest to the ground. Jumps feeling shorter, falling slower, but taking about as much time is a huge reason as to why some may use the term floaty. However, I found something much more concrete when comparing the movement. Surprisingly enough, it wasn't the vertical speed that was different. It was the horizontal speed. It takes about half a second longer to come to a complete stop from the top speed in New Super Mario Bros, which ultimately means it takes longer to turn Mario around as well. I don't know if floaty is the best word to describe this difference. Either way, the difference in momentum is definitely there. I personally believe a more accurate word would be slower, which again, isn't inherently a bad thing. Another contributor to how Mario feels to control, whether it be artificial or not, is the new art style and animations. A new game having new graphics might seem sort of like a no-duh thing, but as you'll see as we continue through the series, the original DS entry probably deserves credit for this. Mario, the bosses, and many of the enemies all exert fully animated 3D models despite the game playing in 2D. It looks pretty damn good too. Well, relative to the hardware, of course. You would think the 2D tile sets contrasting of 3D models would be pretty jarring. It's not though. It's all pretty damn seamless. All of the overworlds are likewise rendered in 3D. As previously mentioned, two of these themes are brand new to 2D Mario. Perhaps it's just because they have returned in literally every NSMB game post DS, but the cliffside and toxic jungle levels feel like they have been in Mario since the very beginning. I especially like the cliffside levels. Doing some wall shimmying, is that a word? While dodging obstacles is a fun challenge. Of course, with a new graphic style comes a new soundtrack. Koji Kondo delivers an insanely catchy set of tunes yet again, with the main theme in particular stacking right up there with the original 1-1 theme. Also in a very nice attention to detail, the enemies will even dance anytime a ba is uttered. Outside presentation, there are a ton of new features introduced to Super Mario Bros. DS, like Star Coins. Yeah, they are so commonplace now, I think most people forgot this was the game they were first introduced. Loads of new enemies too. Ghost with boxing gloves, weird block robot dudes, morbidly obese booze, this guy that throws up snowballs, bombs of racially stereotyped lips. <laughs> Gary the Snail, Pissed Off Crows, Scrunchy Little Worms, Pond Skitters, and pumpkins that make an oddly realistic skull crushing sound. New bosses as well. 2D Marios have always had a bit of a problem with all of the end world bosses feeling more or less the same to fight. This is a bit of an issue still with the mini castles, since it is always Bowser Jr. The bosses in the large castles, however, are all significantly distinct from one another. My personal favorite being the Monty Mola tank. Why? because it's a Monty Mola goddamn tank. With a new Mario, there is always a new power-up to be found, of which New Super Mario Bros. happens to have three. The first, I can't believe I haven't mentioned it yet. All the advertisements for this game centered around it. Hell, it's even promoted on the damn box. If you haven't figured it out by now, I'm referring to the Mega Mushroom, one of these babies, and you're rampaging through an entire level, destroying just about anything you touch. Well, except for this one yellow block right here, because fuck you. For many people, this was the defining feature of the original New Super Mario Bros. Pretty underutilized though, I gotta say. Outside the first level, the only other point in the game where you're really gonna see a Mega Mushroom are the Mega Mushroom houses you can buy of Star Coins. It's an underutilized power-up in general, honestly. Of the five new Super Mario Bros. games, six if you count Deluxe on Switch, only two have the Mega Mushroom. We need some more Mega Mushroom love. Even Mario Kart got rid of it. And no, I'm not counting to her. In stark contrast to the Mega Mushroom, there is the Mini Mushroom. In a way, you could perhaps consider this to be a power down. It's got a lot of pros and cons to it. On one hand, it makes you jump higher, fall slower, fit in tiny pipes, run on water, and in the later entries, even run up walls. Contrarily, you can no longer kill enemies with a standard jump, and one little touch from any baddie, and you're dead. In New Super Mario Bros. for Nintendo DS specifically, the use of the Mini Mushroom is how you access worlds 4 and 7. I'm glad this idea wasn't reused, but for a little quirk in a single game, it's a creative touch. Lastly, there's the Blue Shell. If you duck while wearing one, the Blue Shell allows you to avoid being hit by things that inflict damage. The more notable change is the ability to turn into a spinning shell whenever you dash, allowing you to defeat enemies you come in contact with. The Blue Shell makes speedrunning level a whole lot of fun. It has always been a top 5 power up for me. Also, I couldn't find any mention of this online, but it also helps you swim faster. I just wanted to, you know, let that be known. The blue shell really needs to make a comeback. The Mega Mushroom we've at least seen in the odd title from time to time. The shell suit power up, on the other hand, has only ever been in New Super Mario Bros. for DS. I mean, unless we're counting Mario and Luigi, I guess. But one, that's not a main series Mario game. And two, that wasn't even developed by Nintendo. The last bit of new content to discuss is the Mario vs. Luigi mode 
mode and the mini games. Starting with Mario vs. Luigi, this is a competitive two player mode where each player races to see who can collect the most stars. The levels, which there are five of, are small continuous loops. The bottom screen will periodically place a star and show you its location somewhere within the loop. You need to be diligent enough to keep your eye on the bottom screen to make sure you know where it's going to be and to also make sure you're collecting coins along the way. Get eight standard coins and you'll be rewarded anything from a basic mushroom to its mega variant. Screwing with the other player is totally encouraged as well because you have the ability to knock out some of their stars by jumping on them or attacking them with a power-up. Overall, I gotta say, why the hell hasn't this ever come back? This is such a crazy fun mode and I cannot even begin to estimate how many hours my friends and I have sunk into this back during its release. I'm not gonna harp on this right now, but Jesus. This game mode is so brilliantly executed on all fronts, outside only having five stages. I can't think of a single gripe I have with this mode. Moving on, there are minigames, which is another mode that never came back. Most of these minigames are just the ones from Mario 64 DS, but hey, extra content is extra content, even if it's returning stuff. The major allure to these minigames is that for the first time, you can play them with up to three other people. You're able to compete for the most wins, or just do some free play. I don't remember spending too long of these. But again, additional side content is always welcome. <laughs> Needless to say, with all this new stuff, New Super Mario Bros. was a very smart title given all it accomplished, even among its successors. The original on DS holds up in many ways. There are a lot of themes that feel a bit tired, sure. World 1 is kind of just your basic grassland, World 2 is your standard desert, and just like 80% of other Marios, the game caps off with your uninspired lava theme. But there is still a decent amount of variety in there. There's a level where you're riding on Dory, another where you're being chased by a giant eel, rising on weight-sensitive platforms, giant wigglers, and even a sewer level. Levels like this show off another strength of New Super Mario Bros. DS, and that's density. The level themes themselves are whatever, but things are tightly packed in such a manner that makes it clear. The designers were very considerate of how each stage played out start to finish. It's the little things, like I love how half of the World 2 castle takes place outside the castle, or how the secrets are cleverly hidden, but not too cryptic. The first castle, for example. There's a secret that has you go off the screen to the right. This might seem way too obscure, but a perceptive eye will notice that this one block right here has a different movement pattern from the rest. Thematically, the only thing I can really complain about is WHY THE HELL AREN'T THERE ANY BEACH LEVELS IN THE BEACH WORLD? Seriously, if you just take the main path, all you get is a bunch of crappy water levels. Even the extra levels you have to buy that are on the shore on the map just feel like your standard grassland levels with some water. In fact, the only level in the entire game with a sandy shore is in the mountain world. So yeah, that's pretty dumb, but that's one hell of a nitpick. New Super Mario Bros. set out to completely revitalize the series, and it did just that. It brought back old fans, while simultaneously introducing new ones. New level themes, new enemies, new power-ups, new music, and a great new art style that hit you right in the nostalgia from day one. It was a brilliant start to the new Super Mario series. And to this day, I still think it stands the test of time. This wasn't the best-selling DS game for nothing. Nintendo really knocked it out of the park. But could they keep up the momentum? Well, time for the next game. Well, with the success of both the first game and the Wii itself, it should basically come to no surprise that Nintendo would release a successor on their home console at the time. You know, I was really excited for this game when it was first announced. I don't know how many of you remember this, but during the Wii's Prime, there used to be a channel on there called the Nintendo Channel. It was basically a channel where Nintendo would post all the newest trailers and previews. Whenever there was an E3, the stuff Nintendo showed off there would be here on the Nintendo Channel for everyone to check out. The Nintendo Channel was the very first time I heard about Mario Bros. Wii, and I was pretty hyped, for one reason and one reason alone. Four player co-op. I don't know what the hell took Nintendo so long to make a mainline four player Mario game, but goddamn, it was finally coming. In spite of my initial excitement, today I find the multiplayer aspect specifically is both Mario Wii's biggest strength and weakness. What do I mean by that? I'll tell you after the story. Mario, Luigi, and Princess Peach are all celebrating her birthday. Also, these two toads are there too for some reason. Then a giant cake gets scooted in, and out pop the Koopalings. They throw the cake on top of the princess, which somehow translates to trapping her and not killing her, and the cake is stowed onto their airship. Our heroes, Mario, Luigi, and two random toads, all chase after the airship to save her. These two other toads, which I guess have been deemed less important by the game looking to help, shove Peach's presence into a cannon and shoot them out to our heroes, which begs the question. 
Why did they get Princess Peach a bunch of propeller hats and penguin suits as presents? Probably a kink or something. I don't know. So it's up to you and maybe three other people if you got friends. To travel through eight worlds and defeat Bowser and yada yada yada, we've seen all this before. I mean, like, we've really seen this before. All eight world themes are the same exact themes we saw in the DS. If you've ever wondered why this series has garnished the notorious claim that they're all the same game, it all started here. It's not uncommon to have returning themes in a new Mario, but for literally every single world to be recycling the themes from the last game. That's pretty damn lazy. Thankfully, the overworlds are a bit more expansive. As to say, they're not always a straight path from left to right. World 6 is especially cool because it sees you scaling a mountain. I also appreciate how, unlike DS, there's a bit more animation than just a path appearing. In many instances, you will see the land terraform just like in Mario World, but there I just did it again. Compare the feature to something present in a previous title. Everything here is extremely polished. And if this was one of your first Marios, you wouldn't even know what was or wasn't being reused. You would just be having a good time. That being said, longtime fans, and especially those who play DS, will definitely know what's up right away. Reused world themes, reused level ideas, reused assets, even most of the music is reused. Really, start to finish, we get majorly new Super Mario Bros. DS music. The Wii renditions of these songs definitely sound cleaner, but I don't know about better. The DS sounds had a ton of energy to them. The main theme really exemplified this by the backing chiptune sound. Take a listen. Now here's that same exact song on the Wii. Again, a cleaner sound overall, but that energy is totally gone. Mario Bros. Wii doesn't have many new enemies either. I mean, it technically does, but they're mostly variations of the enemies we've seen in previous Mario games. For example, Mario Bros. Wii introduces Big Fuzzies, which are just the big versions of Fuzzies from Mario World. There's a Big Urchin, which again is a big version of a Mario World enemy. Then there's a Heavy Parabeetle, which is just... Are you seeing a pattern here? Really, the only enemies that come to mind that aren't some sort of variation on an older enemy are the Vine Lake dudes in World 5 and the Sliding Penguins from World 3. There's nothing wrong with using a handful of classic baddies, but new enemies are such a quintessential part of a new Mario game that the game won't feel too new without them. So, some stuff is reused. Whatever. What was I saying about the multiplayer being both a strength and a weakness? It's clear Nintendo had two goals of Mario Bros. Wii. Those goals being to design a game around multiplayer and making the game accessible enough so players wouldn't feel the multiplayer was too hindering. In in this regard, NSMB Wii does exactly what it sets out to do. Levels follow a proven formula, and multiplayer is a lot of fun. The only thing that could have been better, maybe, is the game not pausing every time a player gets hit. Oh, and also this bubble shit, I guess. When you're playing multiplayer, whenever you die, you come back in a bubble. You can also use the A button to put yourself in the bubble at will, so you can catch up to the other players. The problem? The A button is right next to the D-pad! And if you accidentally press it when there is no other active players, it's an automatic loss. Uh Oops. Oh, I'm just gonna fall. Well, no, well, there you go. Good job. Why would they let you accidentally go into a bubble if you're just going to lose a life? Other than that, the fundamentals of multiplayer work just as one may expect. And again, it's fun. That sounds pretty good, right? What the hell is my problem? The way I see it, formulaic levels to compensate four players results in three main issues. Empty level design, uninspired level design, and easy level design. Let's go one by one. What do I mean by empty? If we compare Wii to DS, even by the very first level, Level. The Wii version uses considerably more blank space. At first, I thought this may be due to the fact the screen is more zoomed out, but continuing to use 1-1 as an example. Here is Mario Wii running at the same resolution scale as DS, and things still seem pretty unpopulated. Wider platforms, big open areas devoid of enemies, this isn't a coincidence. Anyone who's ever played Mario 3D World knows just how crazy multiplayer Mario can get. So when structuring the stages around multiplayer, it likely made the most sense for Nintendo to spread things out. Did it work? I I mean, yeah, sure. In fact, multiplayer can still be so hectic, you won't even notice many of the game's shortcomings when playing with friends. But this comes at the cost of levels feeling really repetitive on single player. World 1 has a level that literally ends with three rotating grass circle blocks back to back without any enemies. That's not level design. That's just trying to fill up enough space so the four players can have breathing room. Which brings us to problem number two, uninspired level design. I should mention that some of the levels in the later half of the game are really damn good.
good. But until then, levels follow a really predictable formula, and I think the game is hurt by the choice to make things feel familiar. One of the more obvious forms of this repetition is to start nearly every level in the game with a power-up box pretty much right off the bat. This is something that persists throughout the entire series, and it's a point I should have brought up with the DS version. Here on the Wii version, however, it feels most counterintuitive. Mario Bros. Wii functions in a similar way to Mario 3, where held items are stored and accessed on the overworld, opposed to within the stages themselves. It's both easy and fun to build up a large collection of reserved power-ups in Mario Bros. Wii, and while a stored fire flower or propeller suit may seem more valuable than a mushroom, in practice, it typically isn't. All you need to do is start the level with a mushroom, and you will almost always be handed a second tier power-up right off the bat. The counter-argument, naturally, would be that if you choose a certain power-up to start the level with from the map select, you can play that level with the most optimal ability to suit said level, which would be a fair counter-argument, if it wasn't for the fact the game already does that for you too. For example, if you are playing a level with tall vertical platforms, and would be greatly aided by the extra boost up, the level will start you off with a propeller suit. If you are playing a water level, levels where a form of offense is invaluable. It provides you with an ice or fire flower. Designing a level around a certain power-up might seem like a good idea, but the inherent issue of this, beyond the aforementioned repetition, is it makes having a reserve of items much less valuable. When the game is more than eager to provide you with the best tools for the job within the level itself. Why even waste that propeller suit when you can just use one of your 20 mushrooms instead? In Mario 3, there was a frog suit that granted you of more efficient swimming. Nevertheless, the water levels themselves never just gave you the suit. It was something you could only get at a mushroom house. What this resulted in is the player having to make an informed decision of which level would be the most optimal to use it. I understand the merit of how Mario Wii is designed. To Nintendo, it is of much higher importance importance to make a game that is accessible than it is to make a game where all the power-ups have justified value. But in situations like this, I think it's important to look at what is being gained in conversion to what is being lost. Either way, this game is damn easy. I don't think being easy is a valid critique on its own. If it was, not a single soul would like Kirby. And hey, I love Kirby. I bring this up though, because Miyamoto himself stated that the DS version was not as difficult as he would have hoped, and he wanted to increase the difficulty for Wii. Being easy isn't bad as long as the game can still hold your interest. But New Super Mario Bros. Wii is easy in spite of it being designed for multiple players. The first two-thirds of the levels being easy, in conjunction to them being likewise empty, makes for a fairly forgettable first couple of worlds. That being said, maybe that's just me. I'm not here to make fun of someone's skill level. If you think this is a hard game, then there's nothing wrong with you. It probably just means I have less of a life than you. It would seem the general consensus online is that this is the hardest New Super Mario Bros. game. And no, I don't just mean by this guy. New Super Mario Bros. Wii is a tough game. Old school tough. This certainly isn't the case now. One of the later entries in particular is easily more difficult. Still, if we are just taking the time of its release into consideration, then yes, I'd say this game gets harder than DS. It has a lower skill floor and a higher skill ceiling. So while I personally wouldn't consider this game to be hard, I do respect it for accommodating a slightly larger variance of skill levels. I want to get more in depth about the level design itself, because it's all over the place. Being completely fair to Mario Bros. Wii, I would say there's a lot more memorable levels here than there are in DS. The problem is that, once again, they're mostly all in the second half of the game. So if someone, like me 10 years ago for example, were to rent this game and only play through the first 3 or 4 worlds, they would likely just assume the rest of the game is as uninspired as the beginning. But it is not. I'll just get the bad stuff out of the way first. There's of course your boring water levels. 4-4 is especially bad, given there is absolutely nothing new introduced. It's just another uninspired water level that might as well have been in World 1. Then there are some parts in some of the levels that just weren't well thought out. This section of the mini castle in World 4 as an example. This thing right here will drop blocks that will ride on the conveyor. And since the block it spits out is random, I was just sitting here waiting for almost a minute until it finally dropped a smaller block that would let me proceed. Of course, you also have some level ideas rehashed, like the one from DS where you're dodging volcanic rocks raining from the sky. But that stuff is forgivable. Every Mario is going to have water levels, and every Mario is going to have level ideas recycled. Not every level is going to be perfect. That's fine. What is less forgivable are the Yoshi levels. Why? Because they're Yoshi levels, not levels where you can get a Yoshi. Anyone familiar with Mario World knows once you get a Yoshi, you have a Yoshi. Simple as that. You might not be able to bring him into castles and stuff, but even then, he will still be waiting for you on the overworld even if you happen to die in said castle. At first, things seem pretty good here on Wii 
too. He can still eat and spit out enemies. He's got a flutter jump. Ah, <laughs> man, Yoshi, it's good to have you back, bud. Then you beat a level. Wait, what? What the hell is going on? Why is he leaving Yoshi? What the hell is this game's problem? They can't just bait and switch us like that. Seriously, the game's all like, hey, you like Yoshi, right? Yes! Yes! Well, that's too bad. You gotta get rid of him. He's on the damn box for Christ's sakes. And he's only in like five levels. The same amount of levels that have the damn darkness gimmick. Oh yeah, Super Mario Wii has those and it gets real carried away with them. Five whole levels where you have limited visibility. There was one in the ghost house and another where you're waiting on this slow as hell raft, but the worst one. In fact, the worst level in the entire game is 8-4. It's a darkness level and it's a water level. Oh. Oh, goody. It's like scraping your knee and shoving salt in the wound. If you are an inspiring game designer and are thinking about putting a level like this in your game, then I have a tip of advice for you. Don't! I know things are sounding bad, but reiterating what I said before, it's not all bad, and that late game stuff is damn solid. Just gonna auto-fire all the cool stuff I remember. A level where you keep enemies off your raft. Actual beach levels. Airships return from Mario 3. Skeleton coaster. Darude sandstorm the level. A level where you're bouncing on clouds. A sewer stage where you can change a water level. The inside of a volcano that somehow manages to feel completely different from all the other cave levels. And a mini castle with a giant spike dildus in the center. <laughs> Oddly enough, I found World 7 to be the most consistent world in regards to quality. Yeah, the cloud area. Who would've thunk? Every single level in that world try something new. Huge flying water bubbles. Giant fuzzies that ride along rails. These platforms you can snap from left to right by tilting the controller. Hell, even the ghost house is alright. They use a bunch of the boxing glove ghosts to punch barrels down at you Donkey Kong style. In fact, the mini castle is good too. It actually uses the vertical space effectively. Using a chain rope elevator, you can swing left to right. Not to mention, this world has the only big castle that ends up feeling unique. This is thanks to all the castle walls being destroyed, which exposes the cloudy world you've just been exploring. If all of the new Super Mario games consistently tried to shake up the level design with new or clever ideas as much as this single world does, then no doubt this series would have a much better reputation. World 7 leading into World 8 was getting me really excited for just what the last castle would be. Because World 8, especially compared to DS, was moderately challenging. But if we are comparing this to DS, then the last castle was pretty damn underwhelming. On the DS, it felt like a real gauntlet. You were flipping the entire level upside down to reach new areas, everything was tightly and ingeniously designed. Unfortunately, the final castle on Wii lasts all of two minutes. Thankfully, the final fight against Bowser is pretty damn climatic. Mild spoilers for the rest of the games here. But this this is easily the best Bowser fight in the entire NSMB series. Unfortunately, he doesn't make up for the rest of the bosses. As you could have guessed from the intro, the Koopalings make a return. And as bad as that sounds in today's context, I'm going to cut New Super Mario Bros. Wii a bit of slack here, because this is the first time we saw them since Super Mario World. We will be seeing these guys later, but for the Wii, it was a nice revival. The fights themselves, however, a huge step back from DS. I won't pretend like all the bosses in DS were the most ingenious things ever, but at at least they felt different. Here on the Wii though, nuh-uh. Almost every single boss fight takes place in an empty room, and the strategy is exactly the same for all of them. You stomp on their head, they spin around, they pop out, you stomp again, rinse and repeat. To make matters even worse, you fight each of these guys two times each. Yeah, once in their respective mini castle, and then again in their big castle. Giving even more praise to World 7, the single boss I specifically remember being cool was the second fight against Ludwig. You're fighting on three wobbly suspended platforms that are racing upward the entire battle. That is awesome. The rest though, I wish they would have done a little more to shake things up. Is there anything entirely new to New Super Mario Bros. Wii? Yeah, there's a few things. Of course, as mentioned, there's the four-way multiplayer. There's a new item minigame. In fact, it's easily the best one in the entire series. It is luck-based, but you can walk out of these things with a huge haul of items. Definitely beats that item roulette in DS. There's a new move thanks to the motion controls of the Wii, the mid-air spin. To pull it off, you shake the remote while airborne. I'm sure all of you know what I think of the Wii's motion controls by now, but honestly, it works pretty well here. In general, I think the 
this spin is a great addition, especially for newbies, since it helps you correct a poorly timed jump. And if you're more of a veteran, it allows you to travel much greater distances with just a basic jump. As expected with any new Mario, we get our hands on some new power-ups. There are once again three new ones, but there's a bit of overlap with two of them. There's a nice flower that, as the name would suggest, lets you shoot ice balls opposed to fireballs. But then there's also the penguin suit that also lets you throw ice balls and has the additional bonus of faster swimming and letting you slide. In other words, as cool as Ice Flower is, it's objectively worse than the Penguin Suit, which begs the question why they included both in the same game. Then there's the Propeller Suit. On one hand, it makes Mario look pretty dumb. In fact, it's likely the dumbest looking power-up ever. For anyone of overly protective parental figures out there, I imagine this is what they may have made you dress like when you told them you wanted to ride your bike. But on the other hand, you get some insane vertical elevation of this. Just one shake of the Wiimote, and you're shooting up to the top of the screen. Just like the mid-air spin, the motion controls are used once again to activate the suit, and they work pretty well here. Eh, for the most part. When the game expects you to use them in a life or death situation is when the problem arises. Finally, we have two new modes. And look, I'm not even going to try to humor these. They are the worst extra modes in any Mario game I have ever played. So we have Free For All and Coin Battle. Free For All is so pointless and makes absolutely no sense. I should mention neither mode explains how it works. But for Coin Battle, that's fine enough, because it's fairly self-explanatory. You battle for coins, simple as that. You pick a level, and by the end, it tallies up who has collected the most coinage to determine a winner. Free For All, on the other hand, man, I have no idea. I think you're battling for the highest score, but it doesn't have any sort of fanfare for the winner. It doesn't say who won, no victory music, no crown, nothing. Really? I'm serious. I'll show you exactly what it looks like when you complete a level in Free For All. What the hell was that about? Nothing happened. Then it says team finished? Was this mode not called free for all? Why wouldn't you just play the main game then? What is the point of this mode? A really big downgrade from the extras in DS if you ask me. Scratch that. If you ask anyone who is sane. I know that was a bitter note to end on, but that's really NSMB Wii in a nutshell. A large series of ups and downs. It's pretty easy to point out the flaws of new Super Mario Bros. Wii. There's a lot of them. And frankly, this game is all over the place in terms of quality. In many instances, you can tell they gave it their all, like in the levels of World 7. And then there's other times where it is so lazy, they literally use the font Arial for all the menu text. I'm not even kidding. Despite the nitpicks, come on, it's four-player Mario. That's a pretty big deal. The biggest highlight of NSMB Wii is its multiplayer. For Nintendo's first time dabbling in a multiplayer Mario adventure, I gotta say, they really knocked it out of the park. I can critique this game all I want, but at the end of the day, I still had the most fun playing this Mario Bros with three other players than any other of the future entries. Even on single player, I was genuinely surprised just how enjoyable the Wii version gets. The beginning couple of worlds can be a bit uninspired. Inspired. But if you stick it out till the end of the game, I think you'll find this one to be a great time as well. Which is something that I wish somebody would have told me when I first played it. Nevertheless, this puts Mario Wii in an awkward position. Because something I will always hold true to is that the two most important parts of any game is the beginning and how it ends. How a game ends is important because that's the lasting impression a player is left with when completing a game. And the beginning is important because that's the player's first impression of a game. If a game has a weak start. It's unlikely you'll even bother to get to the end. Further proof of that is that nine years ago, I simply didn't. To anyone new to my channel, I don't want you to think I'm saying Mario Wii is some terrible abomination. Trust me, I am very familiar with how certain people respond when you aren't as enthusiastic about something as they are. But when it comes to game design, I like to be forward with my thoughts and honest with the viewer. All this being said, I certainly don't want anyone to think I straight up do not like this game. Because I do. In fact, out of all these games, Wii is the version I'd most want to go back to right now. Overall, I think New Super Mario Bros. Wii is pretty good, which is something that nine years ago, I thought would never come out of my mouth. I certainly had a lot more to say about it than I thought I would, so that has to count for something. I'd say the multiplayer makes up for most of the game's shortcomings, but if Nintendo was going to bring us more Mario Bros, they would really need to step things up for the sequel. Did they? Eh, time for the next game. <laughs>
Mario Brothers 2. If there's anything I've noticed about Nintendo over the years, it's that they seem to respond solely to sales and little else. I mean, more sales means people want more games like this, right? This seems like sound logic. Until you realize Paper Mario Sticker Star sold more than both Thousand Year Door and 64. Right away, you can probably see why this philosophy is null. The sales of Sicker Star itself led to the most underperforming game in the series, Paper Mario Color Splash, a more or less follow-up to Sicker Star that nobody asked for. I bring this up because Mario Bros. Wii and DS are two of the best-selling games on their respective consoles. Wait, no. Two of the best-selling games, period. Hey look, they're right next to each other on a list of best-selling games, how about that? But while those games did extremely well and people enjoyed them, the major consensus was that, even by the second entry, things were beginning to feel a bit samey. People were just done with new Super Mario Bros. for now. Once again though, Nintendo responding to sales and not public opinion, announced not one, but two new Super Mario games during the same E3. And to the dismay of many, these two new games looked like anything but new. Seriously. Many fans, myself included, didn't even give these games a fair shot. I mean, again, two new Super Mario games during the same exact E3. It's clearly different from the new Wii U Mario game that Reggie talked about earlier. <laughs> We're going to be disregarding all of that and try to look at both of these on their own merits. But I wanted to make sure to give you context going in. That aside, let's look at the story. We see the brothers at Peach's castle waving goodbye to the princess so they can collect coins and giggle like idiots. <laughs> Then literally 10 seconds later, all of the Koopalings appear with the princess already kidnapped. Pretty impressive time frame. But also, why would you leave the princess completely unattended like that? She gets kidnapped when people are around for Christ's sakes. So yeah, you go have an adventure so you can save the princess and defeat Bowser or whatever. Yeah, you know the drill. Things are starting to look pretty been there, done that by this point. And yeah, totally. There is somehow even less content in New Super Mario 2 than there was in the Wii version. But in terms of theming, New Super Mario 2 does more with the little it has to at least feel different. The best way to put it is that on paper, Paper. It would seem the Wii version tried harder, but in regards to execution, I would argue that 2 had more effort put into it. It's the little things, really. For one, despite using the same tired left-to-right overworld layout, NSMB2 is the only game in the entire series to finally diverge from this strange tradition of reusing all eight world themes. The mountain theme no longer has a respective world, and the beach and jungle worlds have been compressed into a single area, which is perfectly fine by me given the last two Beach worlds have been almost nothing but water stages anyway, so I really don't think it's much of a loss considering New Super Mario 2 mostly has a focus on the sandy beach aspect, and in their place are World Mushroom and Flower. They both share a bonus world theme, with a lot of the levels being primarily constructed out of colorful blocks. It's nothing groundbreaking, but I give a brownie points for at least being different. The overworld cannons make a return, but this time they aren't just given to you. To successfully skip a world, you have to complete a short auto runner segment, which is a cool idea. There's a lot of Mario 3 influence here, giving the game a bit more of an identity. A stolen identity, sure, but it feels more characteristic than the previous games. Of course, the raccoon leaf does make a return as well, but we also get that Mario 3 aesthetic with tons of vibrant colors and those bolted box things. Yeah, those things. I never really knew what those were, but that's pretty dang reminiscent of Mario 3. Much like Wii, most of the soundtrack here is recycled from the previous entry. You know how I was saying that the Wii had a lot of music reused? Used. The overworld theme, the athletic theme, cave theme, mushroom house, boss music, probably some more I'm forgetting. But the point is, Mario Bros. Wii reused a lot of tunes. Well, believe it or not, New Super Mario 2 has even less new music tracks than Mario Bros. Wii did. The standout deviation, however, is they added a significant number of do's and bahs. <laughs> People seem to either love or hate the decision to do this, but personally, I genuinely think it sounds cool. It has sort of an acapella feel to it. More importantly, it helps make the otherwise dull sounds of Mario Bros. Wii feel energetic once again. Check it out. So here's Wii. And then here's two.
If someone didn't like acapella, I guess I could understand why they might prefer the soundtrack in the Wii version instead. People who don't like acapella don't have a soul anyway, so who cares what they think. Overall, enough has been changed to not feel like a complete retread. That being said, I do feel guilty giving Wii the cold shoulder while praising 2, because it's not all fresh. As the intro would suggest, all of the Koopalings are back, and their encounters are nearly identical to Wii. As for the mini castles, we see the return of Resnors from Mario World. On the plus side, you no longer have to fight each Koopaling twice. The downside being, now you have to fight these assholes every single world. Don't hold your breath on that final confrontation of Bowser either. It is a better boss fight than DS, but it's a step down from Wii as far as I'm concerned. Even though two of the world themes don't make a standalone appearance, the worlds that do return have eerily similar layouts to new Super Mario Bros. DS. In fact, the canon in World 1 is not only accessed by the first castle just like in DS, but even the way you find it is the same. So in the original New Super Mario Bros. DS, you went through a door, and then once you came in this room, you went off screen to the right to find a secret exit. And then in the sequel on 3DS, you also go in a door, and then once you come in this room, you go off screen to the right to find a secret exit. <laughs> Nevertheless, New Super Mario Bros. 2 has one major trick up its sleeve that really distinguishes Distinguishes it from its peers. Well, more accurately, two as we'll discuss later, but one that they could really market on the box. Coins everywhere! Coins from the sky, coins from the ground, coins from bricks, coins from hammer bros, red coins, blue coins, giant coins, butt cheeks, coins from pipes, coins from your head. Coins! Adding a ton of coins might not seem like a huge deal on its own, but it's all justified by the simple addition of a global coin counter. Yeah, that's it. Just a counter. Moreover, a coin counter might not seem like a game changer, but much like the crown in 3D World, something that should be little more than aesthetic at best, it can completely change the way you approach the game. Not only will it keep track of how many coins you've collected throughout the course of the game, but it keeps an individual coin counter high score for each stage. Due to this, I found myself doing something I never do in a Mario game. Backtracking through a level just to find coins I may have missed. In this sense, New Super Mario Bros. 2 plays sort of like a collectathon, which I don't think is a bad change if it makes it stand out from its predecessors. You would think that the coin gimmick would get old pretty dang fast, but Nintendo added a plethora of new ways to get coins. There's golden rings that make enemies start sprouting out coins, such as making lackadoos throw out coins instead of spinies, or even Koopa shells leaving a trail of coins whenever you throw them. Then there's the POW blocks, which will emit a coin for every block they destroy. There are these gold blocks that shoot out coins the faster you run, and jeez. Running as fast as you can to have this golden stream of coins trailing behind you is one of the most satisfying things I've experienced in a Mario game. Then there's the golden flower. It's like printing my own money. New and exclusive to NSMB2. The gold flower lets you shoot fireballs that turn blocks, enemies, you name it, into cold hard cash. I know I said New Super Mario 2 innovates the least out of all the titles we've covered thus far, because it does. And yet, the simple change of incentivizing coin collecting heavily influenced how I approached the game, and New Super Mario 2 has my respect for that. Who knew that the addition of one simple little counter would change the entire dynamic of how a Mario game is played? And yet, here we are. I mean hell, the fact that I would replay levels I already 100%ed just because I was signified I would be granted a gold coin block is proof enough that Nintendo's approach to the coin collection aspect was extremely effective. I have to question one design choice, however. Getting a bazillion coins in every level, and then watching a global coin counter go up is a ton of fun, but 100 coins still nets you a 1-up. You can probably see where this is going. With the new focus being on racking up a coin count, it makes the live system more trivial than ever before. By the time I finished World 1, I had 57 lives! 57 lives after World 1! And the levels aren't any harder than the ones we saw on DS or Wii, so it's not like you're realistically going to lose that many. Or at least, the main levels are pretty easy. I have heard horror stories about the DLC for this game. To further trivialize it all, every single world still has the 1-up houses. Look, for a second time, I'm not here to mock the skill level of anyone watching. But who the hell is going to be so bad at New Super Mario 2 that they'll be like, Oh 
thank God a one-up house. I was running so low. Even beyond the coin collection aspect, the element of this game that stood out the most, believe it or not, is the level design. I don't know what to say. They are just well-designed levels. Unlike the barren wastelands of New Super Mario Fallout Edition, or at least the first half of that game, the level designs in New Super Mario 2 feel very deliberate and concise, even as early as World 1. More importantly, they are all distinct. In general, I found the stages in New Super Mario Bros. 2 to all be pretty clever. There's nothing crazy, but it's a step above the almost copy and paste presets we're used to seeing in New Super Mario. For example, in the desert world, there's a whole level that takes place on top of totem poles. I've never seen that in a Mario game before. World 1 has a level that's almost entirely made up of pipes, which yeah, isn't anything we haven't seen in a Mario game before. But that is a very unconventional level trope for World 1. World 5 had a sky garden that straight up reminded me of the sky garden in Sonic and Knuckles, which is pretty cool. World 3 had a level where you're running on water the whole time, also very cool. Even a lot of little things create the impression of divergency, like using a cliffside backdrop to during sunset for a pipe stage, or having trees in one of the World 1 stages. Yeah, sure, it might just be a bunch of trees. But for one, <laughs> believe it or not, none of the other new Super Marios have giant trees within the level layouts themselves. And two, you can fly on top of them and find hidden secrets. Honestly, it's crazy how just a little aesthetic touch can change the entire feel of a level. But I suppose that puts it in line with the coin gimmick of the game. Actually, just this game as a whole. Small changes that make a world of difference. Even though little has been updated, all of the updates present make for a surprisingly fresh experience. Plus, it just feels good to play. Even if a bunch of stuff is being recycled, there weren't that many bad parts. Hardly any water stages in comparison to its predecessor. There are no dumbass dark levels, thank god. And the stuff here, for the most part, let you take them at your own pace. And the engine is still solid. I mean, it's basically the same as the previous two titles. Though I did notice I had a couple of Sonic 2 chemical plant ass moments where I would get quote unquote squashed on seemingly nothing. <laughs> like what the hell happened here? As far as everything else, the sound quality is nice, graphics look great for 3DS. In fact, it seems this entry specifically had the most vibrant colors. Those two bonus multiplayer modes from the Wii version are gone, but that can hardly be considered a loss. Instead, we have a coin rush mode, where you try to accumulate the most coins within three random stages, and co-op returns, in the form of wireless play. I do question why the hell you have to share the same screen if you are literally on two separate pieces of hardware, but the multiplayer otherwise is structurally sound. As a whole, I'm at loss for words, really, because I look at this game, I see that it innovated basically nothing, and yet there I was having a great time. So many of these levels are just plain fun, simple as that. It's just a fun game. I don't know how else to put it. People may think I'm going way too easy on New Super Mario 2, and that's probably true, but the bottom line is this. The changes made, as minor as they may be, changed not only the way I approached the levels, but the tone of the entire game, which is something that I can only say about one other entry in the entire series. But we'll get there soon enough. It's the same, it's different, it's New Super Mario Bros. 2. I'm willing to forgive a lot just because of the fun factor alone. This specific entry appears to be the most disregarded in the entire series because people tend to focus on what little it added opposed to what it did. And hey, it's hard to blame them. But coming from someone who played all these games back to back, New Super Mario Bros. 2 is better than one may expect. And personally, I'm glad I gave it a shot. But the consensus was that people didn't care either way, because it seemed that this was little more than a stopgap until the next big entry in the series, launching on a brand new Nintendo console. Surely, this brand new hardware would finally offer us the perfect Mario Bros. experience, right? Well, time to move on to the next one and find out.
Nintendo fans were excited that Nintendo was finally going to release their first ever HD system. And who better to show us the power of this new console than Mario himself? When it comes to Nintendo consoles, it's typically the Mario Bros that break the ice and show us what this new console is all about. Super Mario World, a launch title for the Super Nintendo, was a fantastic game and an even better launch title to show the power of the Super Nintendo. Mario 64, the launch title for the Nintendo 64, was as well another great game. So great in fact, it paved the way for all 3D platformers to come. So fast forwarding to Mario U, it is immediately apparent why many were unimpressed. People were like, so this is the game that's going to kick off Nintendo's first ever HD system? It has a crisp HD resolution, sure, but honestly, I am not that convinced this looks even that much better than Mario Brothers on the Wii. In fact, if you were to run both of these games in HD, I would not blame you for mistaking one for the other. I should make a brief mention that this game started out as a game called New Super Mario Brothers me, which was little more than a tech demo to show off the Wii U's gamepad before eventually becoming the game we all know today. Despite having a 3 year development, not a whole lot else changed. It was on a brand new console, sure, but the closest Mario U gets to taking advantage of the new hardware is being able to tap the screen and seeing a block appear. Even in an interview, Awada expressed concern about making sure this one really felt different since New Super Mario 2 had just come out. But the developers were adamant that this would be the thing that really distinguishes this game from the others. This key feature, it was simply just so memorable, so inseparable from the title's identity that, uh, um, they flat out got rid of it in the Switch port. Well, so much for being a key feature. And if you're of the mindset that this feature couldn't have possibly been on another console, then you should go tell that to the Murphy gimmick of Rayman Legends. Something that was specifically designed for the gamepad, but was still included in other ports. This is a bit of a hot take, but I believe new Super Mario Bros. U is partially to blame for the failure of the Wii U. Launch titles play a pivotal role in the success of a console's first few years. If you need further proof of this, just look back at the rocky start of the PS3. Or conversely, the Nintendo Switch, a console that did exceedingly well at launch due to just one great game alone. Once again, context is important. But as always, I think it's only fair to look at Mario U on its own merits. An underwhelming game isn't always synonymous with a bad game. So let's take a look. The Mario Bros, Princess Peach, and two random toads again are all hanging out eating cake and drinking tea, all partaking in a friendly discussion as to why they still don't have any security. Hey, wouldn't it be funny if Bowser broke in again? Yeah! Good thing that won't happen! Oh no, it happened. This time, instead of capturing the princess, Bowser grabs our heroes and throws them out. So while the objective is still to save the princess, this time around, you travel back to her castle instead of Bowser's. Given the plot revolves around Mario being thrown out of the Mushroom Kingdom and making the journey back, I was hoping there would be an excuse to finally mix things up in terms of progression. You know, like a role reversal of sorts in the order of worlds you explore. Like maybe you would start out in the lava world and then by the end of the game you finish off in the grassland. But nope, it's the same exact themes once again in the same exact order. Yeah, this is the fourth new Super Mario and we're still using the whole grassland, desert, snow world, etc. But hey, there's at least one difference. Every world has like food names now for some reason. It doesn't translate to anything in the levels themselves unfortunately. World 2 gave me some false hope being called Layer Cake Desert. I mean even the overworld had giant frosted cakes. The levels themselves however, just basic desert levels again. And before I get several comments about this, yes, Mario World did have a similar issue. However, I don't believe doing the same thing twice suddenly makes it okay. If anything, I think the opposite is true. At least you see the gradual transformation from a pleasant castle in the green field to one surrounded by lava. By the time your adventure comes to an end, the castle is completely infested in evil. That's what evil looks like. As for the layout of the world itself, it's an actual world. Taking a page from Super Mario World, we have one giant conjoined world instead of a bunch of individual areas you select from a menu. Pretty damn big too. I think I'd still have to give the upper hand to the overworld in Mario World though. The progression in that game seemed a lot more natural, whereas in Mario U, it is very clear where one theme ends and another one begins. The worst offender is the transition to the desert world to the ice world. No joke, you're in a 
scorching hot desert, and after climbing a small ladder, you're in a freezing tundra. Also missing is a star road equivalent, which tied the map together nicely in world. In Mario U, we instead have a bunch of pipes that launch you everywhere, and eh, it works. Just feels sort of uninspired. There is a star world of sorts here, but that's just a post-game world 9 similar to what we saw in Wii and 3DS. Although I do think the new sprawling overworld is a great set piece, and would likely make for a cool looking poster for your room or something. How it's all laid out feels disjointed in practicality. Likewise from Mario World, we see the return of Baby Yoshis, which behave a bit differently from how we originally saw them in that game. Instead of feeding them so they can grow into a big Yoshi, the ones in Mario U, they never grow. You can still use them to eat enemies. And the absence of their evolution is likely to put a bigger spotlight on their new abilities. They even sing along to the current music, which is pretty adorable. Oh, and get this. There are normal Yoshis here that you still can't take out of the respective levels. But these baby Yoshis you have to carry, these, you can take out of the levels. Okay, so if the concern was to restrict Yoshi to specific levels to make the most out of him, then let me ask a perfectly reasonable question. Why the hell can't you keep the normal Yoshis if you can hold on to the baby ones? Did they realize how little sense this made when adding the babies? Anyways, the blue baby Yoshi can spit out bubbles to trap enemies, the pink one can inflate itself to float upward, and the gold Yoshi will provide light in dark areas. And you know what a light emitting Yoshi means? That's right, those lovely darkness levels are back. They even brought back my favorite, underwater darkness levels. Oh boy, it's like scraping your knee in the same exact spot as last time and shoving even more salt in there. Mario U only has one new power-up this time, that being the flying scroll suit. It allows you to glide and sprout upwards by shaking the remote. A single new power-up this time might sound pretty lame, and yeah I suppose it is, but Mario U still manages to have the most power-ups in the entire series. This is thanks to the extra world containing both the penguin suit and propeller suit. I genuinely love how this is handled too, because just like the example I gave in Wii when talking about Mario 3's frog suit, they have managed to take these two power-ups that used to be fairly common, and make them feel extremely valuable by holding their hand until the very end. You can only get these in World 9. This may seem insignificant, but it's fascinating how valuable they've made both of these suits simply by restricting them to the end of the game. My jaw literally dropped when I went into the item house expecting the typical mushroom and star, but instead was greeted with two items I didn't even know were in the game. The additional perk to this design choice is that it addresses a problem I had in Wii, which was the redundancy of having both an ice flower and an objectively better power-up that could also shoot ice. Much like how Mario 3 justified having both the raccoon leaf and the tanuki suit in the same game by limiting the use of the tanuki suit to a finite number, it is likewise justified in Mario U since the penguin suit is extremely rare. In Mario U, you cannot get them in the basic overworld mushroom houses or just replay a level that had the suit like you could in Mario Wii. Again, these suits are only in the World 9 mushroom houses, a minor addition, but a respectable one. Mario Brothers Wii U introduces a fair number of baddies as well. Time for the roll call. Dragon Eels, Pink Walruses, Deformed Goombas, Robofish, Silly Putty Squirrels, and yes, that purple rascal Nabbit. Nabbit will randomly appear in select levels, with a bag of stolen goodies with him. If you select a level that Nabbit is in, you have a chance to catch him for a P Acorn, a variation of the flying squirrel suit that lets you fly indefinitely. You know, kind of like the P Wing in Mario 3. Presentation wise, things are good. Simple, but good. The complete tone of Mario U and its worlds are less sterile than Mario Bros on Wii. On the Wii version, things were nice and clean, but not a lot was going on. But here in the Wii U version, there's a lot more going on in the background, a bigger variety of platforms, and in general, better use of color. Speaking for myself here, but I prefer the vibrant neon colors of New Super Mario Bros 2 because I think it lends itself better to an environment that feels more fun, for lack of a better word. But Mario U still has a great art style all the same. Music wise, eh. Once again, we have most of the Wii songs here. There are a few new ones, but otherwise, the desert music is the same, the beach music is the same, the cave music is the same, the jungle music is the same. It's lazy, but it's what you'd expect by now. That aside, things are sounding pretty alright so far. There's more new stuff than before, a giant world to explore, that just rhymed, baby Yoshis, but as I'm sure you've caught on by now, I have a huge obsession with the level designs themselves. So how does Mario U fare 
in that respect. At first, I thought better. Compared to the Wii, the first couple of worlds are more condensed and thought out, which overall I'd say is better, but this change also makes multiplayer less manageable. Mario U strikes a weird in-between because if you're playing single player, the level designs still don't feel quite as distinct as the handheld entries. But since the levels aren't as open as Wii, multiplayer in a large group doesn't work as well. Honestly, I'd say Mario U is a two, maybe three player game. First impressions were good though. It wasn't until I completed the game and looked back, did I realize I retained next to nothing playing Mario U. I tried to think about what levels I remembered. I remember a level where you climb a beanstalk. There's a secret water level that's pretty cool, since it actually strays away from all the NSMB presets we're typically used to seeing. So brownie points for that. Lastly, I remember that one stage it looks like a Van Gogh painting. I wish they did more inspired stuff like this more often, but yeah, it's only done in this one stage. And as far as I remember, I think that's about it. I might have been harsh on the Wii, but for Christ's sake, at least the Wii version had a decent amount of levels I remembered. Don't get me wrong. There is a decent amount of stuff I didn't mention yet that I do remember from Mario U, but the reason I didn't mention them is because they are all repeats of stuff we have already seen. We had an auto scroller of pair beetles, so you has a level of pair beetles. We had an icicle cave, so you had an icicle cave. We had a level where you keep enemies off your raft, so you had a level where you keep enemies off your raft. Mario We had a sky level of giant fuzzies on rails, so you has a look, you get the point. The contrast between Mario U and New Super Mario 2 is unbelievable. Here we have a game that added twice as much as NSMB 2 does, and has half as many new ideas. In a vacuum of space, I think I would say Mario U has better level design over the Wii version overall, but it's hard to really give any sort of credit to Wii U when Mario Wii did all of this first. Not to mention, Wii U may have more variety, but Mario Bros. Wii had a greater fun factor. Both of these games have their stinkers, but I found there were more levels in Mario U I flat out didn't like. I mean either that, or my tolerance has dropped due to playing hours on end of these games back to back. Whatever the case, an example of a level I just did not care for was that vertical castle elevator from World 8. Again, here's another idea ripped straight from the Wii, but the Wii version did it so much better. Having a castle take place outdoors was way more refreshing than the 100th fire castle for one, and the moving bullet bills were much more of a dynamic challenge in the stationary electrical lines. I was originally really excited to play Mario U. I did remember it being better, but the longer the game went on, the more I had to critique. I I suppose you could say it's different in that regard. The Wii version got better as it went on, and Wii U got worse. If you need additional examples that they were running out of steam, then look no further than the star coins of this game. Mario U is not only formulaic with its star coins, but in many instances, arguably unfair. There were a couple times like here in World 2, where I would play a stage over and over looking for that last missing star coin just to find out the solution was a single invisible block placed in the butt fuck of nowhere. I was somehow expected to find. Having the star coin hiding behind a random hidden block is not a clever way to hide a collectible. Because when people cave in and finally look it up online, they're not gonna go, oh duh, why didn't I think of that? Their response is going to be something more along the lines of, are you fucking kidding me with this? In the DS game, there may have been a cryptic secret here and there, but there was always something giving you a slight hint. Using the example from when we were talking about Mario Brothers on DS, the first fortress in that game has a secret where you have to go off screen to find it, but in the spot it's discovered. This block right here has a different movement pattern from the rest. Again, it's ambiguous, but it's something. Meanwhile, Mario U has a secret where you need to run back into a solid wall, and then duck and slide to reveal a pipe. Who the f*** would even think to do that? Way too many of the star coins in this game, or even just secrets in general, are behind hidden walls. There are other ways to hide a secret than to just put it behind a fake wall. In fact, Mario Bros. DS doesn't have any fake walls, and I far from 100%ed that game when I replayed it. A perfect example that there can be well-hidden star coins without resorting to this tactic is the last pipe here in the fourth castle. Many people will likely not catch it, but anyone keeping a perceptive eye out will notice it. There are many ways you can hide a star coin, but several secrets in Mario U are so aggravating because instead of thinking of something clever, they resort to one of three categories. One, some random invisible block you need to find. Two, running through a fake wall. Or three, purposely locking the camera so you're unable to find a star coin or secret in plain sight. I don't think any of these three methods are inherently bad, but when the game is constantly relying on these three cheap tricks over and over again, it discourages the collection aspect altogether. All the new stuff may be nice, but when the levels are this bankrupt for creativity, it's going to take a lot more than some Baby Yoshis and one new power-up to actually feel, you know, <coughs> 
because outside some new modes and a new control method I'll get into shortly, that really is just about it. The world themes are the same, most of the music is the same, the playable characters are the same, the bosses are the Koopalings again, the final fight against Bowser is underwhelming at best, and every mini tower boss fight is a boom boom. The only exception to that is one fight with Kimmich, which was also a fight from Wii. I know the other games are just as guilty for a lot of these things, but this is the fourth damn game. I don't think it's selfish of me, or anyone else for that matter, to expect a little something more. Outside the increased resolution, did Nintendo do anything with the new hardware? <sighs> yes, boost mode. You know, that, th that thing I was talking about earlier, you know, the mode where you tap the gamepad to make platforms. For fuck's sake, even Murphy, the only bad part of Rayman Legends, was better than this. Nobody wants to be the guy on the gamepad. You want to actually play. I don't know if Nintendo thought people would actually be into this or what, but no one I know cares about this sort of thing. I mean, really, do you want to be the person poking a gamepad or one of the people actually playing the damn game? This is essentially the little sibling mode. Do you have parents that make you play your games with your little siblings? Well, then make them use the gamepad. I want to play, I want to play. Oh, you do? Well, all right, here you go. You can be the platform placer guy. Maybe I'm being way too harsh on Mario Bros. U. So let's end this on a good note. The extra modes. Coin battle, boost rush, and last but certainly not least, challenge mode. And it's well worthy of that title. Coin battle is the same as it was from Wii. Not a personal favorite, but it's fun enough. If they were to bring back any of the modes from Wii, I'm just glad it wasn't free for all. I do like the tally up at the end they added. It breaks down who got what coins through what methods. There is even some added fanfare. It makes the mode feel a lot more substantial than in Wii, where it seemed like a last minute addition. Boost Rush is a cooperative mode where you and some friends try to beat a level as fast as you can. The catch is that the screen scrolls automatically, and to speed it up, you collect coins. A cool idea, and it's executed well. The last mode, which I personally think is downplayed given how fun it is, is the challenge mode. If you're like me, and think these games are way too easy, then you will love this mode. It's categorized into Time Attack, Coin Collection, 1-Up Rally, Special, and Boost Mode. Time Attack sees you trying to reach the flagpole as quickly as possible. Some of these challenges are legit hard if you're going for the gold ranking. If you are not continually running right the entire level, you are not getting gold. Coin collection is all about completing the stage while getting either as many or as few coins as possible. 1-Up Rally centers on you defeating as many enemies as possible to rack up a collection of 1-Ups. Special is a variety of challenges, such as beating an entire level without using any snake blocks. However, some of these seem out of place, like the Graceful Glide mission for example. In this mission, you have to stomp on as many enemies as possible to rack up 1-Ups. I don't know, shouldn't that just have been in the 1-Up Rally section? Finally, there's the boost mode, which is eh. These are a collection of stages where the person on the gamepad has to help the person playing on the TV by placing a bunch of platforms everywhere. Boost mode aside, most of these challenges are a ton of fun and provide some of the most difficult, if not the most difficult, challenges you'll ever see in a Mario game. Coming from the guy who has been grousing about all of these games being way too easy for the duration of this retrospective, some of these challenges gave me a pretty rough time. Here I was thinking I was pretty good, but god damn. When I started scripting this entry for New Super Mario Bros. U, I was sincerely shocked how negative it was. The biggest revelation I had while playing was, geez, maybe I was too harsh on the Wii. And I'm not even saying this is a bad game. I had a really fun time playing through it. Definitely was never in a bad mood or anything, but I suppose that's just what happens when you play nothing but New Super Mario games for an entire month. If you didn't keep up with this series, then Mario U would probably seem like the best one because it takes a little bit from each of the previous three installments. At the end of the day. It is a good game, but we the consumers deserved better, and the Wii U definitely deserved better. With a launch title like New Super Mario Bros. U, the poor thing hardly stood a chance. If this is your favorite NSMB game, I don't want you to feel bad for my own disposition, because I do recognize what it does well. If you like the game, then please continue to like it. As for me, I had fun. Nonetheless, I personally don't think it has enough of an identity to stand out. Whether you liked it or not, people were just done. Outright. We all had fun with at least one of these games, but they are all just too similar to be invested in the future of the series. Especially if their next game was... DLC. Ugh. 
I am so freaking burnt out on these games, all right? I am mentally done, but I need to finish what I started. It's time we talk about the last game in the series, New Super Luigi U. There is no way a game this late in the series could possibly feel any different, R right? Well, I guess let's take a look. The Wii U didn't sell well, New Super Mario Bros. U didn't sell well, relatively speaking at least. It is the third best selling game on the Wii U, but it only sold a sixth of what Mario Bros. DS and Wii sold. So why Nintendo decided to sell DLC for a game that didn't do well on a console that didn't do well is beyond me. It didn't receive much fanfare or sell a whole lot as you would expect, even though it later had a physical release and everything. I don't know anyone in person that has ever played this thing, even among my friends that had a Wii U. So going into this, I really didn't know what to expect. I popped it in, my friend and I sat down and played it, and mind my hyperbole here, but holy cow, this one was astonishingly so damn good. I couldn't believe it. My friends couldn't believe it. We were constantly laughing, constantly being surprised by a new Super Mario game. It's actually challenging, the levels are memorable, the multiplayer didn't make me want to kill the person next to me, the new gimmicks make you play it differently. It's a pretty dang well thought out game. It's just good. What the hell is going on here? Luigi U? The worst performing entry in the entire series. Really? This is the one that changed my mind. This is the good one. Where do I even start? Uh, the beginning, probably. Okay. We have the same exact opening as the previous game. Bowser grabs our cast of characters and throws them out of the castle. The only difference? Mario isn't there. Instead, there is just his hat. Cue all the overly dramatic game theories on how Mario is dead or something. Your goal is still to save Princess Peach, which was a horribly missed opportunity to use Daisy instead. After the intro, you are thrown into the overworld, and that's when you notice... Wait a second. This is the same exact overworld as Mario U. At first glance, it might be tempting to call Luigi U the laziest of the new Super Mario Bros. games. Stating that is probably... Uh, half true. It reuses the same music, assets, bosses, and even overworld as the standard Mario U. That being said, Luigi U is similar to NSMB2, in the sense that it was given an inch and it takes it a mile. Luigi U has just but a handful of changes and designs the entire game around them, the most notable of which being Luigi himself and the minuscule timer. Starting with Luigi, unlike in Mario U, he controls much differently than his older brother. He is significantly floatier and performs much higher jumps. This alone would be enough to make the game have an entirely different feel. But the second biggest change... You will be hearing that in each and every level throughout your adventure. In each and every level, you are given exactly 100 seconds to reach a flagpole, incentivizing you to speedrun your way through this adventure more so than ever before. A slight difference is that Luigi U doesn't use schmeckens, unlike the rest of the series. The other Mario games may have timers, but they count down faster than a real timer would. What this means is that 100 seconds in the other games is approximately one minute, whereas here in Luigi U, it is genuinely one 1 minute and 40 seconds. But to be completely honest, I think I would have preferred the original timer speed. I love how these levels incentivize you to run through them, but I would complete some of these with a whole minute to spare. In other words, I would have personally liked a bit more pressure. In any case, the stress is still there, in a good way. Constant speed, constant energy. I swear Luigi U was designed to cater to people with extremely short attention spans. So yeah, Luigi U was designed for me. Luigi U is also the very first game in the series to add a character character that actually behaves differently. Nabbit. Yes, you can indeed play as that little butthole from before. He is a really unique addition. His catch is that he can't be killed by enemies. But alternatively, he doesn't have any power-up transformations. If you try to pick up a power-up as Nabbit, he will just put it in his bag. Which is a great way to rack up some lives. Because every item you nab as Nabbit will be converted into a life at the end of the stage. And trust me, you're going to need those. Because Luigi U can get pretty dang hard. Luigi U really 
Ashley benefits from the addition of Nabbit because it makes the multiplayer manageable, dare I say required, for two reasons. The first being that since Nabbit cannot get hurt by enemies, the path the person playing as Nabbit will take is likely to be much different than the path the person playing as Luigi will take, which obviously will clear up some more space between the players. The second reason being that multiplayer interactions have been reduced, which personally, I think is a good thing, because I don't know why picking up and throwing people is added in the first place. You always do it by accident and it leads to someone's death every single time. <laughs> Nabbit is great because two players would simply not work on these more condensed levels without him. I mean, this basically plays like two-player Meat Boy. So the last thing you want is to constantly be screwing each other over. My friend, TONY, is a complete ass when we play co-op games because he always messes with me. I mean, when we were playing the Wii version, he was doing shit like this. He stole my Yoshi! He didn't even fucking need it! He already had one! Isn't that like one of the Ten Commandments or something? Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not hijack another man's Yoshi! But since they removed some of the interactions, like being able to pick up and harm other players, we were able to play this game together and have a good time. And if Luigi U can be both incredibly difficult and be good as a multiplayer game, that is a tremendous triumph as far as I'm concerned. I have heard some people complain about the time despite the entire game being designed around it, but especially for multiplayer. I think this is a good change, because players are more pressured to work together and focus on the levels themselves. All of that stuff is great, but the real reason Luigi U is so dang good is because these are flat out some of the best level designs we've seen in years. Every platform, every coin, every enemy feels like it was deliberately placed down to the tile. For every NSMB game I covered, I probably remember something around 50% of the stages. Some games less. Being honest, it's hard to remember every last level when most of them in these games are not distinctive in many ways outside of their respective world theme. Luigi U, on the other hand, I think I remember almost every last stage in the entire game. They are all unique, they are all interesting, and they are all fun. So how exactly do these levels feel different? I already established there aren't many new assets. So what could Luigi U possibly do that we have not seen a million times already in the other Mario Bros. games. <clears throat> A beach level of little ocean huts. A level made out of rainbow walls. A level about ferris wheels in the sky. Ice bros making platforms for you by freezing fuzzies. A beach level that start to finish has a bottomless pit without any grass tiles or water pools. A level made up of snake blocks. A gauntlet of creepy staring Easter Island heads that try to push you back. A level where you're in a cloud the whole time. A level made up entirely of ginormous water geysers. A sunny outdoor castle where you're being chased by a giant bullet. A deep jungle level where you try to outclimb toxic rising grape juice. I believe also making this the first ever jungle level with a vertical orientation in all of Mario. And a level that is being created while you play it. All of these are ideas that are completely new to the new Super Mario series. And there is even more I didn't mention. Some might dismiss all of this as being gimmicky, but given how stale things were starting to get for the series, that can hardly be considered a negative. Even a lot of the darker levels are okay. Light Up Lift Tower is a perfect example as to why this is. The dark levels still have much of the stage hidden in darkness, but the sources of light are spread out enough to not hide any of the more crucial elements. Additionally, to the great level layouts. Items truly do feel useful this time. Many of the stages don't hand out a power-up in the very beginning. Hell, there were a few levels where I didn't get a single power-up at all, even for the ones that do have items right away. Starting with an item still has value because it saves you time you would otherwise be spending in said level trying to scramble for items. In the other games, this obviously wasn't a factor because you weren't always crunching for time. But now that the entire game is designed around time, every second counts. Even something as simple as trying to get an item at the start of a level could put potentially mean the difference between losing or beating a stage. All of this to say, your personal overworld item collection has more value than ever before. Despite what it may seem on the surface, you can tell the developers really cared about the product they were crafting here. For a lower budget DLC, we still got brand new tile sets and level assets, tons of new level ideas, hidden Luigi's. Yeah, to commemorate the year of Luigi, they hid a bunch of little 8-bit Luigi's everywhere. Do they do anything? <laughs> Not at all. It's all just for fun. Which to me, only only further demonstrates they genuinely cared. Honestly, I love when developers add a bunch of little easter eggs like this. 
Wow, this all sounds really fantastic so far. Is there anything wrong with Luigi U? Eh, I thought of a few things. They don't kill the experience or anything, but they're worth mentioning. To prevent sounding like a massive hypocrite, especially since I really harped on Mario U for this. Some of these secrets are still really, really obscure, to the point where you're just going to need to look some of these up if you want any chance in 100%ing this. And then there's the recycled stuff. Assets I could deal with, since that just seems to be par for the course in this series. Bosses, I think, are the greater issue. We have been fighting the Koopalings in NSMB since we, sure. But they could have made them feel at least slightly different than in Mario U. At least they're disposed of pretty quickly thanks to the higher jumping. But yeah, I'm sure there's a sizable amount of people out there who are willing to dismiss Luigi U for not adding any new enemies or power-ups, reusing the overworld, and normally I would be with those people. Although in this specific scenario, I'm willing to give Luigi U a bit of grace for three reasons. 1. This game was released digitally at a third of Mario U's retail price since it was DLC. You could even buy it separately as its own standalone game, which is what I have. 2. It's no secret that the Wii U was not exactly the hot seller Nintendo was hoping for. I mean, the Wii U sold roughly half as many units of what the GameCube sold, which, if you remember, was already selling worse than the PS2 and Xbox. Nintendo was not as financially comfortable as they are now with the Switch. I mean, if the best a new Super Mario game can do on this console is a total of 5.7 mil between all countries, they probably weren't willing to give Luigi U the money it needed to truly be something 100% unique simply because they likely would not see a return on their budget. And three, for what they had to work with, which is to say, not much in terms of new stuff. They really gave it their all. As showcased, most of the heavy lifting is left to the level design. And again, it's damn good stuff. The best in the entire series, if you ask me. People seem to judge Luigi U in the same way they judge NSMB2. They determine the value of these games on how much new stuff they added, opposed to how it's actually used. And I think that's unfair, because why are we really playing a Mario game at that point? Whether or not they are sequels, we like to play games that feel like a new experience. And if they are able to accomplish that with the level design alone, well, then I don't know about anyone else, but it definitely has my respect for that. As I said before, I was playing new Super Mario Bros. non-stop for this analysis, so by the time I got to Luigi U, I was so tired of it all, but this video wasn't going to be complete without it, so I toughed it out. Maybe what I'm about to say is because I got so tired of the new Super Mario formula, but damn, in my opinion, new Super Luigi U is easily my favorite in the entire series, and I can't believe I'm saying that. Again, possibly being unfair to the rest of the games here, which are all good, don't get me wrong, but when you play all five of these back to back, you will be begging for something even slightly abnormal, and Luigi U is just that. It's super fun, fast paced, pretty difficult, and fairly creative. Honestly, Luigi U feels like a collection of the best speedrun levels in Mario Maker 2. I don't mean that as a negative either, because these are really well designed levels. That's it. This is the new Super Mario Bros game for me, and it doesn't even have Mario Bros in the title. <laughs> Are we good now? Have we covered it all? Jeez, this has been one hell of a journey. I suspect you're done with your popcorn by now, if you were, you know, watching this entire retrospective and eating popcorn. So, in conclusion, I still think they all hold up. Each and every new Super Mario game has at least one thing going for it. I have the most respect for the DS entry, given it innovated the most and started the series, not to mention that kick-ass versus mode. The Wii version has the best multiplayer, and even though it has a slow introduction, by the end of the game, things start to get really good. New Super Mario 2 was the one I thought I'd enjoy the least, but its emphasis on coin collection makes for a surprisingly engaging experience. Some people seem dead set on hating this entry the most, and I definitely like it more than others. No secret there. Either way, I think it deserves at least a little more credit for its execution. Mario U has the most polished presentation. I would also say this is the best NSMB game for two-player if you want a more casual experience. 
and Luigi U is one hell of a curveball. This is the game you want to play if you want an honest challenge, or even just something a little different. I've told you my personal favorite, but if you're unsure on which game to play, I made a flowchart you can check out for shits and giggles. Links to it in the description. Otherwise, let me know which one you like the most. I'm not just saying that either. I genuinely like hearing from you guys. I mean, you listened to me blabber on for who knows how long, so I think it's only fair if I listen to your thoughts as well. Hey, Hockey, what are you up to? Kermit, I'm doing a video right now. Remember that time I broke a hole through your wall? Ah, oh, good times. Yeah, that was literally the other day. In fact, the wall is still broken. Yeah, that was funny. No, it wasn't! It was loud and you scared the hell out of everyone. So, uh, what video are you doing anyway? Um, it's, uh, which new Super Mario game is the best? Hmm. What? You know people are just gonna skip to the end for the answer, then they'll be mad at you because they don't agree with it. Why would they get mad if they didn't even listen to the context for my answer? It doesn't matter. Most people aren't rational on the internet, you know. Well, that might happen for people who have the attention span of a goldfish. Blah 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 blah. But I'm sure my viewers are mature enough to listen to my reasoning for each entry before making a rash judgment. And if they did click on a timestamp, they would be respectful enough to go back and watch the whole video first. <laughs> what? Hey, thank you so much for watching my retrospective. This was such a huge project for me, so I really hope you enjoyed it. I would like to give a shout out to some of my patrons, such as Abby Knutson, Aiden Ross, Amanda Guth, BlakeDog72, Cashinator, Guardian of Art, Jeffrey Long, John Hancock, Common CJ, Ken Colton, Miles Mann, Victoria Mars, Rami Batter, and Sonic Caddy. Have a great evening, and until next time, have a good one.